Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us that you are on our side. And as we study your word, this one more time, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would grant all of us attentive ears and obedient hearts so we can understand and obey your will as it is in Jesus. Speak, Lord. We are listening. In the name of Jesus, amen. As usual, all praise, all glory to God. Each time I am privileged to stand before his people. It's been a blessing to prepare the word for today. And I do believe that someone needs to hear what the Lord has to say. And if you are that someone, I'm going to make an appeal at the end and pray with you. I greet you all in the name of Jesus, and I welcome all visitors in our church today. This is your church. Anytime you want to, please join us. And anytime you don't feel like going to church, come here and worship with us. And you will find Jesus. Because Pocono Grace Seventh Adventist Church is all about Jesus. The um, pictures that I use in my presentation today are all duly referenced. And this is important because sometimes we neglect to say so and uh, trouble can come. Today, I am pleased and blessed to tell you that we have baptism uh, in the church today. And it's a blessing. Um, thank you for the kind words uh, through the elders. Um, pastoring is not a burden. I just wish I had a little more hours every day to serve the church, but we all have only 24 hours and try to make the best out of what we have. Of course, we have our uh, renovation project, remember it. Uh, we need to fix our church building. Uh, that's a challenge that we're facing. Um, be prepared also for the health uh, seminar. It's important, especially with mental health that is really ravaging people today. Of course, you know this quote already, and I'm gonna read it twice, the first time as it is, and the second time as it should be read for the hour. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. Now I'm going to read it the Adventist way. Pocono Grace, the church is still God's appointed agency for the salvation of Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. That was a weak amen there. That's who we are. We are the church for everybody. And this church was organized to serve everybody. And the mission of this church is to carry the gospel, not to a specific group of people, but to the world. And the only way we can do it is by the Holy Spirit working in us. The last time I was here, I spoke 
on the Christ-like man emphasis day. And the title was, A Man According to God's Own Heart. And we discovered and learned that what God needs of men today is integrity. That is biblical integrity. It is in fact the greatest want of the world. Men who would not be bought or sold. And we learned that to be that man, we need to behold the man. And the man we behold is Jesus Christ. Today, the title of the message is Joy Born Out of Sorrow. And it is taken from John 16, 19 to 22. I don't know in what state of mind you came here today. And this message comes from very deep in my experience, and I would say my recent experience with God. And as I stumbled on this idea, I was reading the Bible, and, and for the first time, I paused and I said, what is the meaning of this? How can sorrow beget joy? Normally, the law of nature states that if you plant a mango seed, what do you get? You get mangoes, so you, you reap what you sow. And how can joy be born out of sorrow. I don't know about you, but sometimes some of us may feel this way. We do the right things right, but we seem to get evil in return. I don't know if I get a witness there. Sometimes life feels like, well, I go to church. I pray, I fast, I give tithe, I have family worship, I do all these things, but why is it that I feel so bitter? I, I feel that I'm getting only evil in return. Now, you're not the first person to feel that way. And this is a reality check, you know? Um, some time we don't realize that what happens to us in life, especially after we feel that we've done good, can be problematic to us. And it reminded me of a man in the Bible called Asaph in Psalm 73, and he was having a little problem because he was a kind of a pastor in his days, he was a Levite, and he only saw evil in spite of all the good that he was doing. And he said in Psalm 73 that, surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. That's a very strange statement. I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. And then you have in Malachi a group of people who expressed the same sentiment. And God heard, I said, God heard them talking. These were a group of church members, and, and, and this is what God told them. You have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners and before the Lord of hosts? In other words, they are saying and, and saying that they, they, they don't feel that they did the right choice by following God. 
because of the reality they are facing. Now, you have here Asaph, who is doing what we call today a kind of negative self-talk. He is talking to himself and he is feeling that life is not what he expected to be, especially life in God. And in the book of Malachi, what you get there is not only negative self-talk, but negative group talk. Because sometimes we love to have friends to complain with. And my question to myself was, what do your words and hardship tell about the God you profess? And of course, we... That's not the right PowerPoint. Anyways, that's fine. We experience trauma sometimes. I don't know about you, but I have gone through a lot in the short time I have lived on earth. Sometimes you might feel that you start at life on the wrong foot. Maybe because of the way you were born. Some of us are born with congenital defects. Maybe you started in the wrong foot because on the wrong foot because you were born in the wrong family. Or you were raised with the wrong community. Or you come from the wrong country. And these are things that we don't have control over. And these things affect us and they can traumatize us for life. But there are other things we do not control also. I call them life's curved balls. As you live and go about your business, you meet with worries, wounds, and woes, and hurt, and scars, and skeletons, and struggles, and dramas, and traumas, and abuse, and many different things. And then you can have another experience that you have control over. I call them personal life blunders which results of the wrong choices we make or we made. And all of this, what I mean by all of this is those things we do not control, like our birth, our family, the community we live in, the country we come from, and some of the curved balls that life throws at us and some of the bad choices we made can land us into frustration, sometimes depression, sometimes hopelessness, and unfortunately, sometimes suicide. And I don't know what brought you here this morning. I don't know how you feel about your life today. Because sometimes, as we move about, there are things within us that keep on giving us a hard time from within. And sometimes these things other people may not be aware of. Maybe, maybe for you, it is a never-ending cycle of financial debt. You see, that thing is there. You try your best to get out of it, but it's like it has claws on you. And then, for some, it's a ceaseless cycle of sickness. You get sick today. You go to the doctor. You get okay. And the next day, another sickness kicks in. Or even someone in your family that is always sick, 
Is it an unabating grief? You, you lost a very dear person some time ago and it's been years and, and you can't just get over it. It's there and you feel it. Or an unending cycle of failures. You've tried and tried and tried. Maybe it's in the business side or uh, whatever projects you've been trying and it's just failure after failure and you have that feeling within you or a persistent wrong habit. It's been years and you've been struggling with that habit and, and you wonder, will it ever go away? For some, it's a prolonged feeling of inadequacy. You don't feel that you belong anywhere, not even in your family. And some of us, not even in our own bodies. Is it a stabbing feeling of betrayal? Someone you trusted betrayed your trust. Maybe your spouse or your parents, your friend, your brother in Christ, your sister in Christ. Maybe it is a continual experience of abuse, of all kinds of abuse, verbal, physical, of sexual, any kinds of abuse. And you have that experience with you, a lingering feeling of guilt. You always go back to that thing you did years ago. And it's eating you up. Guilt is just eating you up. Is it a constant battle with evil forces? There are people who are constantly battling with evil forces. Is it a constant domestic strain? Sometimes the marriage is so tense and you have the feeling that this tension will never go away. You've tried therapy. You've tried compromise. And you've tried all kinds of things. But the tension is still there. Maybe your kids don't like you. They don't call you. They don't want to see you near them. Maybe your brother has ostracized you. Your family doesn't want to see you. And all these things kind of suck the life out of you every day. No matter what the situation is for you, remember, especially for us who proclaim and profess to be Christ's followers. Remember that there is no Christian walk without wounds and scars. I checked from Genesis to Revelation. I didn't find any who went through this earth without being wounded somehow at some point. And now, scars are normally healed wounds. Normally, scars shouldn't hurt. But scars remind us that sometimes we had a wound. But remember, there are self-inflicted wounds. There are people-engineered wounds. And there are Satan-crafted wounds. The Samaritan woman in John 4 who met Jesus at the well and Jesus exposed her life. And she had some self-inflicted wounds because she had chosen a lifestyle that was contrary to what she professed. Some of us, we look at this Samaritan woman as a pagan. She was a believer. Did you hear her speak about the well of Jacob? She knew the word somehow. But her lifestyle was one of self-inflicted wounds. She made the wrong choices. What about the promiscuous woman in John 8? Remember that woman who was caught in the act? 
Now, her case is very interesting because not only did she have self-inflicted wounds, but she also had people engineered wounds. They came to her, they found her, I don't know how, I don't know how they got her out of that bedroom, and they dragged her to Jesus. And some of us, we have people around us like that. When they see us falling, they drag us so we can be finished. In the army, when there's a combat, you will hear something like this. Man down, save him. But unfortunately, in the church, God's army, sometimes what you hear is, man down, shoot him. The crippled woman in Luke 13, she was bent for a long time. And when Jesus came into the scene, he said, this is from the devil. So some of us, we have the devil who is working hard to bend us, to break us. So what I'm saying is that not every wound has the same source. Some come from us. Some come from others. Some come from the devil. And we've seen that in these three women, the Samaritan woman, the promiscuous woman, the crippled woman. But you know one thing I realized with these three ladies? They have one thing in common besides the wounds. All of them at some point encountered Jesus. You see, whether Jesus meets you at the well, or whether people drag you to Jesus with your wounds. Or you meet with Jesus like that crippled woman in church. It doesn't matter where you meet him. The most important thing is that you meet Jesus. And when they met Jesus, something happened to them. All of them. So this being said, as I said earlier, there is no man. No woman who lived on earth without experiencing some kinds of wounds. You want to talk about Job? Or Elijah? Joseph? Daniel? Hannah? Dorcas, and the list goes on and on. But I have selected these especially because Job was doing the right things. But he reaped evil straight from the devil himself. Some of us are like Job. Elijah did the right thing. He prayed and fire came down from heaven, but then, because of Jezebel, he ran away and he found himself in depression. Some of us have Jezebels after us. Hannah did the right thing. She was a faithful, loving wife for her husband. And yet, he brought another woman in the house. Some of us, we have spouses that behave like an agent of the devil in our life. Should I talk about Joseph and how his brothers treated him? Or Daniel in Babylon? Or Dorcas, who was only helping all these old women in the neighborhood? And then she found death. But of all this, how about Jesus? Did he do the right thing? Of course he did. He lived the right life. And as we study in the Sabbath school, 
all that he got or most of that he got in return was rejection, hatred, and the cross. You see, Job, Elijah, Anna, Joseph, Daniel, Dorcas, and Jesus all gave their best to the master. They all did right by God to the best of their ability and knowledge. But they all met evil in spite of doing right for God. Not all were perfect. And yet, even the perfect one was met by evil while only and always doing right and doing good for God and the people. So my friend, meeting evil while doing good is nothing new under the sun. You are not the first to go through it. You have ancestors who went through it. So as you come with me to the book of John, Chapter 16, this is where we want to learn from Jesus how to deal with these things that are eating us up from inside and showing and pretending that everything is okay. You know, it's interesting how easy people will ask you, how are you doing? But how many really want to know how you're doing? <laughs> In John 16, you find a kind of heavy atmosphere. Because Jesus is about to die. And he's saying very strange things to the disciples. In John chapter 15, verse 18 and 19, Jesus tells them, you are going to be hated by the world. That's really strong. And he says, the reason you're going to be hated by the world is because the world hates you. He didn't stop there. Then he says in verse 20, John 15, that the world will persecute you. So it's one thing to be hated, but it's another thing to be persecuted. Persecution is hatred put in action. So you won't only have that feeling that they hate you, they will actually act on this hatred. And then in John 16, verse 2, he tells them, well, a time is coming when they will send you out of the synagogues. They will kind of expel you from the church. And he says in John 2, 16, 2 also that they will kill you. And to make things worse, he says... In verse f verses 4 and 5, you will not see me for a while. That's a lot to take in one conversation. Don't you think so? And you know what? He didn't stop there. Then Jesus said in verse 12, I have even more stuff I would like to share, but you're not ready. I just want to stop there. So this is the message that Christ gave to the disciples that day. They will hate you. They will persecute you, they will expel you, and they will kill you, and I will not be with you. And in fact, there's more, but let me stop there. And I can hear the disciples beginning to think, and that's exactly what John states in the gospel in, in, in chapter 16. This is how it sounded like to me when I was reading as they heard it, think about Peter, James, and John. And you begin to say, the beginning to hear, wait a minute, John. Wait a minute. This doesn't sign, sound like what I signed for. Well, 
he came to us and he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And he trained us and we did so many miracles. And he told us that he is the Savior, he is the Messiah, he is the King, he is the prophet, he is greater than Solomon, greater than the temple. He is the one. John the Baptist pointed to him as the one. So what is he talking about? This doesn't make sense. I didn't sign up for this. And they started discussing, remember? Group negative talk. When one person is disgruntled, the tendency is to recruit. Come, let's complain. And the word in verse 19, that's where the text begins. The word says that Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. The beauty is that Jesus knew. When we complain, Jesus knows. And we hurt, Jesus knows. And you see, he could have just kept quiet, but he started a conversation with the disciples because he wanted to help them. And that's my Jesus for you. He doesn't leave us to our complaints and, and dramas and traumas and, and all that we go through. He comes and he knows how you feel, my friend. Jesus knows. He knows the questions that you have. And verse 20 he dropped the statement. This is his answer to their question. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. What? He's making things worse. So he's telling the disciples, you'll hurt to the core. You will hurt so bad that you will weep. Weeping is not just crying, you know. Have you seen someone weeping? It's a serious crying. And, and he says, while you weep, the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful. Who wants to follow a leader like that? Can you imagine if the pastor comes and says, Oh, Pocono Grace, from now on we're going to suffer. It's going to be tough. There'll be no money. There's, everybody's going to hate us. You won't even be able to walk on the streets. They can shoot you anytime because of Jesus. That's a depressing message. But Jesus tells them. And he tells them because, he tells them because, he tells them because he went through it himself. And he says, the reason they will hate you is because they hate me. The reason they persecute you is because they persecute me. The reason they kill you is because they kill me. The reason they expel you is because they expel me. You get the same treatment. I'm not preaching a gospel I don't leave, says Jesus. But then he concludes the statement. He says, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Wow. Joy born out of sorrow. And he takes an illustration here. He uses a woman giving birth. He says in verse 21, a woman when she is in labor has sorrow. Let me, before I read it, let me share this with you. I don't know about the women here who gave birth. But I have a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine. She's married to my uncle. For her first baby, she told me, we were still students, she said, you know, Christian, I was in pain at the hospital. But the moment that baby came out, she said, I felt like a wind, a hand on my face, and all the pain was gone. And she told me that she believes that that was God. 
And I know that if you ask the women who gave birth, do you remember the pain today? But do you feel the pain today? When you look at that boy, that girl, do you go like, you caused me so much pain, sweetheart. <laughs> and Jesus is taking the same. He says, a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth, the moment the baby is out, she no longer remembers the anguish. Because joy that a human being has been born into the world. And I learned that in labor is sorrow, in birth is joy. See, what Jesus is telling the disciples is that I am going to the cross. And that's going to be painful to you and to me. But beyond the cross, there is joy. And I learned, and this is the statement for the sermon today, I learned that in Christ there is such a thing as joy born out of sorrow. And the word of God in Psalm 30 verse 5 says, For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You see, remember that woman who was bleeding for 12 years? And as she went to touch Jesus' garment, she stretched her faith to the limit, and she was healed by the Savior. She was wounded, but she was healed. And she learned, and she grew, and the name of God was glorified. Yes, in Christ, life wounds are learning opportunities. We ought to learn from our wounds to build our character and to glorify God. And while we hurt, there's three things that can happen. How many things? Number one, negative self-talk and the, the sad thing today is that the negative self-talk is not confined to our brain today because of social media so we project that talk online all the time and we it's eating us up because negative self-talk doesn't solve the problem it amplifies it the other thing that happens is what I call deceptive self-talk. The self-talk self is like, oh, I don't care. I'm okay. Nothing is happening. I'm fine. I'm the strongest. I'm the best. I'm the this. You're being eaten from inside and you pretend that everything is okay. You're deceiving yourself. These two extremes are to be run away from. The only thing that can save you is what I call redemptive self-talk. When you connect with Jesus and Jesus tells you, yes, you are hurting. I know that you are hurting, but I'm here to heal you. I am here to strengthen you, to uphold you. I am here to redeem you. You don't have to deny it. You don't have to exaggerate it. You only have to give it to Jesus. And Jesus says in Luke, John 16, verse 22, and that's powerful, my friend. It's so powerful. I have to try and read it. También vosotros ahora tenéis tristeza, pero os volveré a ver y se gozará vuestro corazón Oskitara Vuestro Gozo. 
I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice. You see, joy doesn't actually come from sorrow, but from Christ. The reason joy turns, sorrow joy turns to joy is because Christ comes in it. And he states, your joy no one will take from you. And in verse 13 he said, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you. So Jesus was telling them, I will not be physically present with you, but I am sending the comforter who will comfort you in your sorrows and your afflictions, and nobody can take that joy away from you. In fact, first Peter, 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 who was saying earlier, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. This is what Peter ended up writing with the influence of the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter 4, 14. Peter! A coward. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, this is Peter. Blessed are you. What? For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That's a different dimension in faith. When your sorrow becomes a way of glorifying God. And Ellen White says that after his ascension, Jesus was to be absent in person. But through the comforter, he would still be with his apostles. And they were not to spend their time in mourning. So this is what the word of God is for us today. Yes, we hurt because of our own choices or what people do to us or what we do to people. But remember, Jesus is here with you. Those who fall into the self, uh, negative self-talk category are those who like playing the victim of the story. Oh, look at me. Nobody loves me. The world is against me. Do you see what they are doing to me? It's a self-centered response to trauma and hurt. Me at the center. There's no Christ in negative self-talk. Am I making sense? So they play the victim. The other group play the hero. Self-deceptive self-talk. I'm okay. I can't be hurt. I'm a man. I'm a woman. I'm independent. Nothing can move me. I'm this, I'm that. But deep inside, we're, we're just dying. They play the hero in their story. I don't know who is in charge. And playing the hero is also a self-centered response to trauma. I don't know which of these you are, a victim or a hero in your story. We like being the center of the story, whether it's a victim or a hero. But what God is expecting of us is that we be redeemed. And when we are redeemed, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Jesus becomes the hero of our story and the victim because of our sin. He paid the price so we can be set free. And the joy that we are after, I have to say this, will not come from politicians. They cannot give you that joy. It will not come from your company they cannot give you that joy, no matter how much money they pay you. It cannot come from your business, no matter how prosperous that business is. It cannot come from a man or a woman, be it your spouse, your children, your friends, your colleagues, whoever that is. The only 
way we can find this kind of joy is in Jesus. And that comes from the Holy Spirit. So it is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So I'm praying, my prayer today is, Lord, make me faithful to you in sorrow and grateful to you in joy after sorrow. If you've been touched by the word today and you want to be prayed for, I told you this comes from very deep in my own experience. I'm inviting you to come join me here as we pray. Anyone for the Lord, come and join me. You're saying, Lord, I want that joy. I want that spirit in my life. I want it too. You not coming doesn't mean that you're doomed. That's not it. It has nothing to do with it. But if you feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit, come and let us pray. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that has come out of your mouth straight to our heart. Lord, we hear you, but it's hard because in reality we hurt. We hurt because of what we face in life because of the wrong choices that we made, because of what other people do to us or say about us, and because of what the devil is doing against us. And that reality, Father, is eating us up every day. We drown in frustration, in depression, in, in guilt, and sometimes even contemplating suicide. Sometimes it feels unbearable just to be alive. We look at our bank account, we look at our work environment, we look at our homes, we look at our marriages, at our children, we even look in the church and all we see is disappointments. And we congregate and instead of speaking faith, we speak fear. Instead of speaking joy, we speak sorrow. And it grows with the negative self-talk and the deceptive self-talk and, and we push Christ out of the picture. And the more, because we don't understand that until Christ is invited in our sorrow, there is no way we can find joy. So Father, your children have come in response to your appeal. It is indeed not by might, nor by power, but by your Holy Spirit. 
So we are praying, Father, today, if there is any sense of guilt, of fear, of failure, of hurt, of disappointment, of inadequacy for whatever reasons, even if there is thoughts of suicide at the hearing of my voice, in the name of Jesus, Father, I pray for freedom. Peace, joy unspeakable, joy immovable, joy everlasting. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may return to your seats. We're going to have the baptism right now. Um, Elder 